you want this? Yeah, just now. At the end of the um, Australian story. Oh, God. No, just quickly. <laughs> did you get Propaganda. Your boys? Propaganda. Did you get your boys out? No, not yet. In fact, one of them just got arrested this morning. Yeah, he may not. He may not belong to this world. For the children being born in Afghanistan today, tomorrow, next week, is there some hope, prosperity, opportunities for them, or is it going to be the same old, same old? Um, apply for an Australian visa. Um, look, you know, it's tried to say that is a deeply troubled nation, nation, and a deeply troubled region of the world. We now see Egypt doing its thing on the backs of Tunisia, Iran. I love the Persians. God, they're good. <laughs> the pistachios, drugs, traffic in Tehran sucks big time, <laughs> trust me. Um, and they've got some fantastic journalists who have come out of there from the most amazing impressions. We just had what I call the Alawi election. I don't know how much any of you follow it. But for the last couple of years, for these US-sponsored elections, and the democracy you know, that America wanted to bring to Iraq, the end result of those elections was that it handed Iraq to the Iranians. Mm. That's unequivocal. Um, every major political party and faction of the Iraqi government is a political party either formed in Tehran, to this day armed and supported by Tehran, or like another friend of mine, the president of Iraq, Mum Jalal, Jalal Talabani, the Kurdish leader of the uh, PUK, president of Iraq. He, you know, he and his group had a long-standing marriage of inconvenience with the Iranians. He's only got one way in and out of his little territory. Sure, That's his land border. His Kurdish rival has Turkey and the lucrative Turkish border crossing. So the Iranians try to spoil his little world. He tries to spoil theirs. At the same time, they're trading and wheeling and dealing. And to this day, the Kurdish pres the Kurd, who is the president of Iraq, and not a bad guy, I've got to say, is listed by the CIA as Iran's number one agent of influence because every time the Americans manage to get a miracle and grab Iranian Quds Force operatives, Mum Jalal steps in and shuffles, shuffles them off across the border. Point being this, we just had another election, long drawn out as I always are. I call this the Alawi election. Ayat Alawi is a Shia which in you know, Muslim terms is kind of like a Protestant, um, but he doesn't practice, he's secular. He was exiled the whole time, Saddam hated him. He organised some boys who helped the Americans during the, the exile. He's CIA to his bootstraps. I love Ida Lowy. He's a close personal friend. We disagree on many, many things, um, like coup d'etat. Um, but... Um, He's the best we got. There's no Janana Gusmao. There's not even a Hamid Karzai, Jesus. Um, there's no Nelson Mandela. So what's happened is Egypt and Britain helped the Sunni insurgency put up a political party or political front that actually pegged back the Iranian vote. So we're in a fascinating political time right now in Iraq. The Americans have got, what, just minutes until they have to be, they're out, last American boot, non-negotiable, out. No matter what happens, gone. These boys are sailing their own ship. Who knows where it will go? It's sitting on the, the world's third largest proven oil reserve, sponsored by the guys with the second world's largest proven oil reserve, and in a love-hate relationship with the guys who have the first <laughs> world's greatest proven oil reserve. If this goes pear-shaped, it won't be pretty. I lived 
the Iraqi Civil War. I don't know how any of you remember 2006, but I remember coming out of your house each morning and finding decapitated bodies of your neighbours in the street en masse. The Sunnis, driven by Al-Qaeda, their signature was they cut the heads off. Basically, it's Catholic Protestant, you know. In Islam, you know, as in Christianity, everyone starts the one way under the Pope, the Caliph, the this, the that. Somewhere along the line, there's a dispute about divorce and your wife, who's next in line, yada, yada, yada. And it's like the Monty Python film, Splitters. <laughs> so it's all driven along those lines. The Sunnis, the Catholics, how I like to deem them, um, behead. You'll find them on the street, a teacher, public servant, Jesus, you know. Hairdressers at one point, because they're cutting beards, doing makeup. Ooh, don't do that. Body would be on the street, from that street, beheaded, and the head would sit in the small of the back. The Protestants, the Shia, their favourite, I terrified medical practitioners by saying, Yeah, I know these guys, these, well, I wouldn't call them friends of mine, but guys I know very well. Yeah, they're amateur neurosurgeons. They go, There's no such thing. I'd say, Oh, yeah, there is. Drill bits. One guy found at the morgue, they dug the porcupine, so that's a drill bits in him. I know one of the Shia Protestant torturers to the Medi Army. He said, it took me a while, but I finally found the best way to drill into a head without killing them till I wanted. That went on for two and a half years. The only way they solved it is that they haven't solved the causes of it yet. It'll come back. They took every... Let's, let's look at Brisbane. They took every suburb of Brisbane, certainly within you know, the inner city areas and the outlying areas, and walled them off with 15-foot concrete barriers. Indrapilly, Indrapilly sealed off. South Bank sealed off. In here, in the CBD sealed off, sealed off, all encasing pretty much homogenised Catholics, Protestants. Christians, you're out of there, gone. 600,000 Christians are left already. And they're still being butchered. So, if your kids lived in Indrapilly but went to Fig Tree Pocket School, forget about it. Homeschool them, folks. There was these amazing things. Because sectarianism, this religious thing, was not in Iraq. When I first met the men who became the high command to the Iraqi insurgency was back in the summer of 03 when they were just out of work, high-ranking military and intelligence officers who went home to the village. I'd sit there and drink whiskey with them. They'd tell me stories about chasing girls and affairs and this and that. They weren't religious. Iraq didn't have the religious divide. Tariq Aziz was a Christian in the cabinet. Protestants, Catholics were in the cabinet. During that civil war, if, you know, and everyone, Catholic Protestant lived next to it. It's like here. It was very much like Australia where religion obviously is a fact of life and a fact of political life, but it's not a dominating factor. That's what it was like. Imagine if you suddenly had to move away from your home or watch your neighbours have to pack up and leave with their kids simply because it turns out they're Methodist or Anglican or Catholic. You probably would never even know. That's the... Yes, uh, happy, happy note. (laughs) Let's focus on Afghanistan. No, too much. 
Uh, but we do have to draw to a close uh, somewhere, and I am uh, very much conscious that uh, you, many of you do have other um, commitments today. Uh, look, Michael, we have had many speakers through our university. We've had um, several very influential and powerful speakers much more, this series. much more respectable than that. I, <laughs> I would not downplay uh, yourself in any way in that regard, but I was going to say I don't think we have ever had such a passionate speaker, uh, someone that really has lived it and lived a life which we hear back in the sort of sleepy hollow, if you like, and the safety of Australia, the safety of, uh, of Brisbane, really fully appreciate. I, I think sometimes we do like to bury our heads in the sand a little bit and pretend that what we see on the TV is actually what it's really like. Uh, but, Michael, we, we sort of know that there is a hidden truth behind all of that, and as I say, I think there is... Uh, there is often a sort of comfort factor in the world in which we live where we don't sometimes really want to know the full truth. And I very much appreciate the way in which you have um, brought yourself out um, from, from your unit. And, um, and as you uh, may have picked up, uh, Michael is suffering at the moment from post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. And it is quite difficult at times for him to get out of the unit and certainly to come and, uh, and face an audience and an audience of people which he, he doesn't know. Uh, and so I congratulate you, Michael, on your courage in doing that. I think you've sent an extremely powerful message to us uh, all here today. And I told you this series is going to challenge you cerebrally. So <laughs> ho hopefully today has certainly done that. All right, so Michael, we do have a, a very small and insufficient tape of our appreciation, which I'd like to present to you. And on behalf of everyone here, look, good luck, mate, and we look forward to the movie. <laughs>